Today's message is one that I really struggled to write. <laughs> it's one that I really struggled to prepare. It took me a lot longer than it should have to get sorted. Not because it's an overly complicated message, it really isn't. But it's because it touches on an area in my life that I haven't given as much value to as I probably should have. It touches on an area in my life that I definitely don't give as much priority to as what God would want me to. And that area is community. The idea that we are created for community, that we are created for connection, the idea that people need people. And I could stand up here and list off all the ways that this is good for us and why it matters. And considering that's the point of the message, I probably will. But before I do, I kind of need to express my failings and my shortcomings in this area so that you sort of know where I'm coming from and what God is doing in my heart through, through this. So I have jokingly, probably too jokingly, often jokingly have said that I do not really like people. People who know me know this. That is a lie though. I really, really love people. I love helping people. I love seeing people grow. I love seeing people succeed and grow into whatever their potential is. I love seeing people learn new things about the Bible and God and themselves. I really, really love people. The problem is I make it as one-sided as I can. In that, in, in that way, I mean, I want to help people, but I don't want people to help me. I want to offer advice but I'm not going to ask anyone else for advice. I want to help and guide people through their hard times. But when I go through hard times, I'm going to lock it down and keep it to myself. And I'm going to work it out myself. And as I prepped this, I had to ask myself the question, why am I like this? Because it's obviously not healthy. And it didn't take me long to work it out. It's because I've had poor examples of community in my life growing up. As a kid, our first community is normally our family, our parents and our siblings. My parents divorced when I was young. So I was, you know, there was messy custody battles and all that sort of stuff. So my concept of community from day one was a bit skewed. Then in primary school, I was a chubby redhead, which is something I've carried successfully through to adulthood. <laughs> if I make the joke, nobody else can. <laughs> which means that at primary school, I was an easy target. So I was bullied, which meant that I was, I developed, you know, some trust issues. I developed some self-esteem issues and I carried them into my early adult life and I struggled to make deep connections with people. I had friends, sure, but those relationships were based more in an activity we were doing, not in the person themselves, which meant that as time moved on and availability shifted, those relationships fell apart because they weren't based on a deep connection, they were just based on whatever we happened to be doing. And I know there are some people here who, are, who know what I'm talking about, who have lots of mates, but not many friends, because there is a difference. But also there's some people here going, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care what my friends and I do together. As long as we keep doing stuff together, that's what matters. There are people here who know what I mean when, when they think of the business of life and when friendships aren't as close as they used to be, they realize they don't have the time or the effort or the motivation to develop and foster new ones. Well, others are going, you are crazy. My friendships, my relationships, my connections are so important to me that I would do everything in my power. I would make every effort to maintain and continue them. So confession time, I have not made every effort at all. At some point in time, I resigned myself to the fact that community is a good thing for everybody else, but it's not fundamentally something that I needed. So that's where my heart and head was at. And then Pastor Rob comes to me and goes, hey, Chris, I know you're already writing a message, but can you shelve that one and write a message on community and inspiring and encouraging people to join a small group? And of course, I went, absolutely, boss. Yes, sir, I'll get that done for you. And internally, I screamed <laughs> because community isn't something that I have placed enough value on. And I needed to share this before I get into the message proper so that you can understand what God is doing in my heart. And hopefully, it can help you relate a little bit to where I'm at and allow God to work on you as well. So in the nearly 40 years of my life, as I said, I have resigned myself to the fact that community was a good thing, it's a healthy thing, it's a necessary thing for everybody else. In fact, community to me 
It was just the people that I was around. It was based in location or activity, not in the people themselves. For most of my adult life, my community was my work colleagues, the people I work with from nine till five. But when one of them resigned or was fired or moved on or whatever, well, then they were no longer part of my community because I no longer work with them. Their replacement now was. The people I considered to be in my community were the people that happened to attend the same places that I did on a regular basis until they no longer did. And what I didn't realise, what I stupidly didn't realise or didn't get is that my disregard for the importance of community in my life was and is doing damage to me. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens the wits of another. When, when I read that, I think of like two iron bars clanging together and sparks flying, but I can tell you if you whack two bits of metal together hard, they don't sharpen each other. They spark and they chip and they bend. No, the process of sharpening an iron tool, it required careful and persistent striking of the tool against the sharpener. If you wanted to sharpen a shovel, for example, you took a long time to gradually hone that edge, to smooth it out, to get it to the desired sharpness. It was a process. The analogy continues, in, which means that we need to have longer-term relationships to continue to refine, grow, and sharpen us. The damage that was being done in my life was that I convinced myself that I was always to be the sharpener never the one being sharpened. I always wanted to, to give out, but I didn't want to take back on board, which means over time, I am worn down, I get chipped away, I get blunted, I get damaged. Ironically, my effectiveness to do the things that I love, which is to support people, becomes less effective because I'm not being refined and honed and grown myself. If our relationships are only one way, they're only one-sided, then we are always doing the sharpening and we're never being sharpened ourselves. Or we are always being sharpened, but we're never giving anything back. We're always being sharpened, but we're never using that sharpness for anything good. We're never doing anything with it. And if we don't have relationships at all, well then we, or the iron, gets brittle, it rusts, and over time it can no longer stand up to any sort of stress. Or worse, we convince ourselves that we have meaningful relationship and great connection because we have 100 plus followers on Facebook and X amount of followers on Instagram. Our relationships get reduced to commenting and posting on people's social media. It's funny, but somehow having the convenience of the whole world at our fingertips has allowed us to disconnect from any real connection. Let me just flip it up a little bit and talk about why, because this is some of the bad stuff and why it sucks for me, but why it is good and why it's important and why we should be striving and straining for community at every chance that we get. In Genesis 2, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper as his partner. We have God looking at Adam in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, a literal paradise where there is no sin, where there is no death, where there's no problems, there's no sickness, there's no nothing. And Adam, who is the first person, he gets to walk in daily relationship with God. It sounds like that should be all he needs. And God looks at him and went, you know what? It's going to be better off for him if he has somebody to do life with. If we fast forward a little bit, in the early Israelite community, their entire worldview revolved around only two things, their survival and their worship of God. The way people lived back, way back then was that everybody contributed to the greater good of their community. They had to, otherwise they didn't live. So they did that and they also made sure they had proper worship of God. That was how they lived. But when that was threatened, death or exile was the result. When anybody did something that threatened either of these foundations, it could not be tolerated. So they had to be removed from the community. That's how important community was to them. But over time, as tribes became towns and towns became cities, and a group of 100 people working together for a common good morphed into millions of people living in close proximity to each other but not knowing each other at all, the necessity of community seemingly disappeared. Its value and importance did not change for the record, but our priorities did. 
because it no longer felt vital to our survival. In those early tribes, everybody had a role to play. Yeah, some handled the food, some did the farming, some did the hunting, some made clothes, some built structures. Everybody had a role to play and they you know, worked together for the greater good. But today, I don't need relationship with the butcher, the baker or the candlestick maker. I, thank you, one laugh. <laughs> I can go to the shops, I can grab my trolley, I can get everything that I could need to live to survive. And now with self-service, I can get everything I need without having to even speak to another human being. With the, all the modern conveniences that we have, we can choose to disconnect because we no longer need connections to be able to live. But with that freedom, we no longer have to connect with everybody. Instead, we can choose who we connect with. So community is simply connection over commonality. Commonality simply being what we have in common. Footy players, footy, people at a footy club, they were, their commonality is the footy. People in a band, the commonality is the music. Mothers groups, their commonality is the trials and struggles and the joys of raising little people. Commonality draws people together. It's the icebreaker. It doesn't matter what that commonality is. It can be video games. It can be movies, books, dancing, going to the gym. It doesn't matter. But it is the commonality that is the starting point which kickstarts deeper relationships. Hebrews says, And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The author here is talking about corporate gatherings of, of church. That's how we often present it. Don't give up on meeting together on a Sunday, but I think the principle is far bigger than that. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, as is the habit of me, but encouraging one another. We should be meeting together throughout the week. Church should be more than just here on a Sunday morning. And what I find funny and what I kind of struggle with is that for every other area of life other than church, people tend to be pretty good at it. Sports people will attend their weekly training, their social nights, their end of season breakups. Musicians will be at band practice. Gamers won't miss their gaming nights. Movie lovers will always find the time to go see the latest releases. Yet, when it comes to church, we somehow think that meeting together here on a Sunday is often enough. Community is simply connection over commonality. And what do we all have in common? God loves us. Even if you don't believe in God yet, this is true. And I'm trying to push the importance of community and ultimately of small groups today, not as a metric. It's not about you know, getting a graph to look pretty and go, we've got X amount of people in a small group. I don't really care about that. And it's definitely not to make your life busier because I know what it's like to be busy, but because I believe community is essential for all of our spiritual, mental, and even physical health. It's essential for us to grow in our faith, to work through our sins, to become more Christ-like. We need to sharpen people around us, and likewise, we need to be sharpened by people. Our relationship with God is more than a Sunday morning. There needs to be a, a bit of a shift in the way we think about church because too often we think about church as being, yes, I'm here from 10.30 to 12 o'clock on a Sunday, I go to church. But there needs to be a shift in that because church is more than just this. Ch church is who we are. Our relationship with God is more than just this. It should be something that we work on constantly in the quiet spaces where it's just you and God. And just as importantly, in community with like-minded believers who can challenge you, who can learn from you, and where you can keep each other accountable to make sure that what you think God is telling you to do is actually in alignment with who God is. When COVID shut down society and people weren't allowed to gather, what happened? Studies show that mental health and stress-related symptoms rose dramatically. When people weren't allowed to get together, when people weren't allowed to socialize, when people weren't allowed to gather, there was a demonstrable proof that people's physical and mental health suffered greatly. And in the spiritual side of stuff, we here at Epi, we, we stayed online as best we could. We tried to be delivered about connecting with people as much as we could. But I know for a fact that it wasn't enough for everybody. I know people from this church, from other churches and churches all around the world that not being able to gather, push their faith, push their concept of community, their value of church to an absolute breaking point, and then 
because they couldn't be supported, because they couldn't gather together, because they couldn't be around other like-minded believers, eventually it broke and they walked away. Community is simply connection over commonality. And when that connection doesn't occur, people feel isolated, they feel forgotten, they feel rejected, they feel unwanted. And then if they live in that space long enough, they convince themselves that they are better off doing life alone. Community is simply connection over commonality. And what do we have in common? Well, as I said, God loves us. For hopefully the vast majority of us, we believe in Jesus. We want to live lives that bring us closer to God. We want to see our friends and family saved. We want to see God working in and through our lives. And let me tell you, we will see greater results, greater transformation, more of what God is doing when we journey together. Matthew 18 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. So why join a small group? If you're not in one already, because it will refine you, equip you, support you, and grow you. It will help you grow into the person that God has created you to be, and it will also help prepare you for whatever it is God wants you to do next. Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. It's not a, a, an instruction for a handful of people. This is a call that every follower of Jesus, every believer is supposed to be doing. The Great Commission, our part in fulfilling this, will vary from person to person, but it is something that we all need to be preparing and training for. Footy players, they train together to increase their skills, but also to better understand the strengths and weaknesses of their teammates so they can work together as a team more cohesively. Musicians practice together so they can discover their sound. They practice together so that, I don't know if you know when, when Beck is worship leading, she makes all these weird hand gestures. <laughs> She's not... <laughs> She's not dancing. This is a complex set of instructions that her band understands. I think that just means play it again. But, you got it. but yes, chorus. Um, <laughs> so that they know where she is leading them. They train and they practice together so that when she does those hand actions, they're not going, what is she doing? They go, yep, we know what that means. And they can keep playing and they can keep working together more cohesively as a team. The nerds like me, video gamers, we will share tips, tricks, and strategies with each other so that we can all become better at the games that we play. Mothers groups will share what has and hasn't worked with their kids and offer support to each other. Yet Christians, if you aren't in a link, if you aren't in a small group, the question I have is who is developing you? Who are you training with? Who is sharpening you? There is a lot of reasons people will come to us and say that they aren't in a small group. Um, I'm only going to go through three of them. If you have others, come see me afterwards because I'm confident I can overcome them with you. But the top three that I hear are, one, I don't have enough time. There's not enough time to be in a small group. Two, you don't think you need it. Or three, you don't think you will fit in. Number one, you don't have enough time. You work all day, you're tired at night, you, you've got kids to deal with. I get it. I promise you, I understand, I, I get it. But if you tell me that you don't have enough time, but then in the next sentence, tell me how you've just binge watched whatever TV series, or you've been to this social event, this social event, this social event, and this social event, the question I'd have is, what do you prioritize? Yeah, that's so true. Do you not have enough time, or do you just not have enough time to gather with other Christians? Links need to be a priority, because they are imperative to be able to continue to grow us, to refine us, to equip us, to, to build us up into the people that God wants us to be. If you actually don't have enough time because you work stupid hours and it's just really difficult to find a night that's free, not because you're filling it up with other random junk, but because it's just legitimately you don't have time, then I would encourage you to say that attending inconsistently is better than not attending at all. Yeah. If you can only attend a small group once a month, do that. Yeah. If it's once a four, do it. it doesn't. You know, if you can make it every week, amazing. But if you can't, go when you can because it is good for you and it is good for the people that you are gathering with. Yeah. 
if you actually don't have time because your rosters are all over the place and the only time that you're available is, say, midday on a, mon- on a Monday, start your own link. Okay, you know what? I'm going to run my own small group based on my availability, which is midday on a Monday morning, because I'm confident that if it works for you, there's going to be other people that it will work for. Yeah, that's right. Uh, at the moment, most of our links are in the evening. The vast majority of them are at night. Nights don't work for everybody. I get it. If that doesn't work for you, start your own. Option two, you don't think you need community. If you truly don't think you need community, if you truly don't think you need anybody in your life, can I tell you that the enemy has has you exactly where he wants you? The enemy wants you isolated because when you are isolated, when there's nobody keeping you accountable, when you're not checking in with anybody, when there's nobody around you, then it's really easy to lie to you. It's really easy to convince you that you are better off alone, but you're not. Because you don't know when you've gotten off track. There's nobody to pull you back in line. And, and what will happen is you'll, you, there'll be enough truth in there to sound convincing, to sound believable. But if you've convinced yourself that you don't need to gather with people, that you don't need anybody else, then you are living and believing a very dangerous lie. Or if you are like me, and you've avoided community and treated it primarily as one way, this is another confession for me, this is selfishness disguised as supportiveness. It's supportive because we generally want to help people, but it's selfish because I don't allow people to use what God has created in them to support and to grow me. That selfishness ultimately will lead to damage, brokenness, bluntness, and being unable to hold up to stress. And you may hear that and you might go, no, no, I'm fine. I don't, I was like that for hmm, probably 35 years. And I could do it all on my own. That was perfectly fine. And it was, and I just keep plodding along, keep getting through stuff. And then my wife got diagnosed with cancer and I went, <laughs> I'm not fine. I'm not fine at all. And I no longer had the strength or the durability to stand up and do that on my own. And thankfully, even if I didn't want it, this community gathered around me and went, Okay, Chris, you can't do this on your own. We're going to pick you up and carry you. The problem is, my my weakness, my my failing in this is, once you got better again, I immediately went back to my old ways of going, cool, I need you for that time, but I don't need you anymore. I'm wrong. I do need people, so keep me accountable. Okay? And lastly, if you don't think you'll fit in, because you're worried that people won't like you or that people won't take you seriously. I would love to promise you that that won't happen. I'm confident that all of our links will be as friendly and accommodating as possible. But the truth is, we don't click with everybody. We don't like everybody. That's okay. Do not give up on community. Yeah. Yeah. What I see happen is, I'll ask somebody, oh, why aren't you in a link? Why aren't you in a small group? Oh, I, I, I tried one a couple of years ago, but I just didn't get along with the group. So I haven't gone back. Or I didn't like the direction they were, were studying. I didn't like what they were doing. So I went, this isn't for me. And I just gave up on it. I would suggest trial the link for a, couple, for a couple of weeks. If it doesn't work for you, if it isn't the right fit, trial another. Yeah. Or if there is a specific area, an interest or hobby that you find it easier to connect over, start your own link based around that because... Even if you think no one else would be interested, I can be pretty confident in saying even those of us who feel most alone would be surprised how many people feel just as alone that are sitting right next to us. Community is simply connection over commonality. What we have in common is that we all need community. If you are already actively involved in a link, there's two things I need you to be doing. I need you to be talking about it. I need you to be sharing with people how good your link is. What you are learning, how it is building you up, how it is encouraging you, how you are getting benefit and value out of it. I need you to be inviting people to come and join you in your link. And secondly, I need you to start giving thought to if it's time to maybe leave your link and start a new one so that you can share those benefits with a different audience and a different group of people. I'm going to name and shame very briefly because Adam was meant to be here today 
but he isn't. So I was going to get you all to go and see Adam after the service, but instead you're going to come see me. So what I want to happen after the service is that I'm going to be down at that desk in the back corner there. If you are not in a link, I want you to come and talk to me. If you are in a link and you're looking to start and start one of your own, come and talk to me. If you don't think you want to be in a link, come and talk to me so I can help you work through those objections. <laughs> Basically, unless you are actively involved in a link, I want you to come and talk to me because I believe that every single one of us needs to be in a group, needs to be in community, needs to be around other people. If it's really, really, really busy, I'll organize someone to come and take your coffee order so you don't miss out or you wait your turn. Yeah. If you are not in a link or you want to start your own, come and see me so I can help you find the best fit for you or work out when, when it would work for you to start one or how to help equip and support you so that if you do start your own, it is successful. And that's pretty much it. If you aren't in a link, I want you to come and speak to me. I'm going to get a QR code put up on the screen. Um, because I can't force people to come and talk to me, I can strongly encourage, they'll be at the door, so I will see you avoiding me. But if you really don't want to, but you still want more information, scan that QR code. It'll take you to our website uh, for small groups. There's a form you can fill out so we can get in touch with you. This is also for the online audience. Do not give up on community, even if you don't think you need it, even if you don't value it like I haven't. It's essential, it's imperative, and we all need it. Let me pray. Father, thank you that from the beginning you have said that it is not good for us to be alone, that it is better if we are, other pe if we are around other people. God, I pray that for those of us who have struggled with community, that you break those objections and you break down those walls that have kept us from connecting with people, and you remind us through your spirit how important it is for us to be around others. God, I pray for that reminder that our common ground is that we are all loved by you, that we are all created by you, that, that we all pursue and desire a relationship with you and we all want to be more Christ. Like I pray that that is the common ground that we connect about and that isn't something that we just do for an hour on a Sunday, but it's something that we do in our daily life, not just in the quiet spaces with us, but with other like-minded believers who can build us up who we can build up, who can keep us accountable, who can keep us in alignment so that we can keep discipling each other. God, I just pray. I pray that you strip back the excuses. I pray that you encourage people to take that step out of creating their own small group. I pray, God, that you revitalize this sense of community that is so important and then it spreads out from here so that we all get it, that we all get how vital and important and necessary community is. God, I pray that you keep working on my heart so that even as I say these words, I don't then go home tomorrow and go, ha, -ha back to back to being my old selfish ways. No, God, I want, I pray that you send people into my life who, who I will let into sharpen me. God, I just pray that I just pray that there is true community, that there is true connection. And ultimately, we are a body of people who gather together corporately on a Sunday. But we also gather together at every opportunity that we get so that we can learn more about you, encourage each other, share testimony, pray together. In Jesus' name.